Very well, warm welcome to this ICLF conversation on presenting the CML highlights of EHA 2023. Um, we are very lucky to be, today to be joined by Professor Andreas Hockhaus from Germany and Professor Tiong Ong from Singapore and the US, who are giving both the clinical and biological highlights of the meeting. Uh, EHA is always a very engaging and informative Congress and the CML program was a highlight. We had 10 oral presentations, five e-posters. We had the education on C session on CML, the scientific working group with, with ELN and the EH EHA for CML. And so it is really a privilege to have both Andreas and Tiong with us today to give highlights of this entire program. So I would now like to Welcome Professor Andreas Hockhaus, who most of us know, but a brief introduction. So Professor Hockhaus is Director of the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology, Coordinator of the University Tumor Center and Co-Director of the Comprehensive Cancer Center Central Germany at Jena University Hospital in Germany. He is full professor for internal medicine, hematology and oncology at the Frederick Schiller University in Jena and served as vice dean for research at the medical faculty from 2010 to 2020. As co-chair of the G German CML Alliance, Andreas is also focused on enhancing access to clinical trials for all patients and driving patient participation. He has published 650 peer-reviewed papers and is co-editor-in-chief of the journal Leukemia. So Andreas will be presenting the key uh, clinical highlights of the EHA Congress, and I will hand over to him now. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Nicola, for your kind introduction. I want to open my screen and start my presentation on what I found was the highlights, were the highlights of our EHA meeting in Frankfurt in June uh, 2023 with regard to clinical highlights uh, in uh, CML. Uh, we met in Frankfurt in a very sunny and, and, and bright uh, weekend. Um, there was some time to visit the city uh, as well, very interesting, vibrant uh, city for colleagues from all over the world. We met patient advocates, uh, we met colleagues, we met uh, uh, colleagues from the pharmaceutical industry, and um, all of these uh, uh, guys are here in the audience. I see uh, uh, very uh, uh, well-known names in the audience. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for uh, being with us, discussing what we uh, found interesting at CML. Very interesting was for me a poster, actually, which was produced um, um, uh, by patient advocates and uh, medical doctors together. It's uh, based on a survey which was um, supported by Novartis, how patients' perceptions on CML treatment is currently. Uh, currently means at different stages of CML treatment. And overall, as you see from these uh, responses from more than 300 patients here, you see that CML has a very high impact uh, on the life, even in TFR, even uh, when treatment is well tolerated. Uh, pa most patients feel physically, emotionally uh, fatigued. Uh, it limits the personal and social life. Um, and this in 2023, when we as doctors claim that we had resolved most of the issues in CML uh, with six drugs now available in most countries uh, worldwide, uh, which is a privilege, of course, for CML doctors to have so many uh, options available. But overall, I think we have a lot of work to do uh, to get a better quality of life uh, for most of our patients. And this is here uh, now summarized, what are the treatment goals? of doctors in, uh, in uh, blue and of patients in orange uh, in first line, second line, and third line. And to see very clear that a patient who's confronted with a newly diagnosed leukemia, of course, want to have this leukemia stopped or slowed down. Uh, the disease progression should be stopped. That's the major aim from 
the patient's perspective. For medical doctors, knowing that we can treat CML very well, it's already in first line to maintain and improve quality of life. But this comes later for the patients as well. Knowing the uh, uh, problems and also the efficacy of first line therapy in second line and third line is always quality of life. That means quality of life is for the patients who have knowledge about the disease, a major aim. And I think that's the most important aim which we currently have knowing that we have the um, availability of six drugs and uh, the option uh, to treat patients very well with regard to disease uh, progression. And of course, it's important to know what we understand on shared decision-making between the patients and the doctor. And uh, this poster demonstrated how many of the doctors think everything is fine. They use shared decision-making in first, second, and third line. And also for the patients, um, if they feel being involved in the decisions over the course of the disease and how much information they received. As you see, that's very heterogeneous. About a third of patients and a third of the doctors think that they involved uh, the other part uh, very much in the decision making. I mentioned already that we have six drugs available. Uh, the classical ATP competing drugs in red here, the red bubbles demonstrate the um, ATP binding site uh, um, uh, inhibition. Uh, of uh, ABLE and of other kinases. Uh, the more bubbles you have, the more kinases are inhibited here in this uh, uh, five ATP competing drugs. But with Asimenev, we have now a more specific drug available with two uh, um, uh, kinases inhibited only, ABLE1 and ABLE2. This is important for our later discussion on the tolerability of uh, different drugs. A poster presented by Tim Hughes um, summarize some sub aspects of the assemble trial. The assemble trial compared bosutinib with asimenib in third and later lines of therapy in a randomized fashion. And um, you realize from these two graphs here that um, a very good efficacy can be achieved even if BCR levels at baseline are more than 10%. Of course, this number is higher uh, with less than 10%, but the difference between asimenib and bosutinib as an example of the classical ATP competing drugs is better um, in, in higher risk patients with a higher baseline load of BCR able. And of course, if we treat uh, patients with intolerance to the most recent uh, TKI, the efficacy is best, but is best for both arms, uh, for bosutinib and for asimilib on the right side. If we treat patients who had uh, the previous uh, uh, drug being uh, uh, resistant to the previous drug, then we have a, a wide difference between asimilib and bosutinib. And if you look specifically at the most recent drugs, and these are depicted here for resistance and for intolerance, you see the highest gain of uh, a response um, when, uh, when imatinib uh, was the uh, previous treatment, which is of course rare in the third line situation. Here you have most patients on nilotinib, dazatinib, or in Asian countries, radotinib. And here you see a very good efficacy. And uh, interestingly enough, the uh, difference between uh, asimenib and bazutinib is very high after the zatinib because the dazatinib is already a multi-kinase inhibitor, which is bosutinib as well. And here with the bcr specific inhibition, you see the highest gain of efficacy compared uh, to dazatinib. Oliver Hanschel uh, presented in a talk at the scientific working group, uh, CML, his modeling on different bcr able mutations. Uh, mutations can happen in the ATP binding site, but also in the so-called Muristil binding site for asimenib. And it's of interest to know that uh, mutation in the ATP binding site can also inhibit the binding of asimenib. It's in a different binding site, but uh, the steric changes in the bcr able protein result in a change of the IC50 of asimenib as well. These models will eventually help 
to titrate the dose of asimilib in a more appropriate fashion. Currently, we have the registration with 80 milligrams per day for third line and for the 315 mutations in the US only with 400 milligrams. But there's a wide range between 80 and 400 milligrams. And therefore, we need these models to learn more about the specific mutations and their impact on the binding of ascimanib to the Muristil binding site. And preclinical work demonstrated that the combination of drugs may, be, may have an advantage. Uh, for instance, the combination of nilotinib and asimilib, but also the combination of bonatinib and asimilib. And this was shown in a talk by Nikola Juric from the Czech Republic. And you see here in the lower part of the, of the panel uh, that a combination of asimilib and bonatinib um, um, uh, was more successful than both drugs alone in Xenograft uh, models here uh, for patients with different combinations of mutations with the 315 in the background. And this may be a, a very useful combination of the two different uh, binding site inhibiting uh, uh, drugs. Um, but in my opinion, uh, mainly for patients with resistance, with mutations, not for patients with uh, in first-line situation, but we will come to this uh, later. My summary of the use of the different uh, methods in third-line, uh, which I presented in the educational session, is uh, depicted here. My personal opinion um, for intolerance, I demonstrated the efficacy data it's of course asimilib uh, is better than any of the mydokinase inhibitors for resistance with PCRB mutations. Asimilib is useful, but ponatinib and rotation of second generation inhibitors are also useful uh, methods depending on the specific mutation. For the 315 mutation, we should consider allogeneic stem cell transplantation or ponatinib. In the US only, of course, asimilib is now registered, and we need um, uh, this option in Europe as well. But there's a lot of work to do to fine tune the use of asimilib in this situation. Resistance without mid PCR mutation, that means uh, activated pathways outside of PCR able. We have all the options with very aggressive mutations. Um, but we need to learn this, of course, which is aggressive. We have allogeneic stem cell transplantation. We have allotransplant definitely in cases with high risk additional chromosomal aberrations like minus seven, um, 17 Q plus deletions or 70 Q deletions uh, or um, 3 Q to 6 aberrations. And the specific cohort of patients with recurrent cytopenias with lack of normal hematopoiesis, here asimilib might be a good option, but also allogeneic mm -hmm. stem cell transplantation mm -hmm. should be considered. I want to present a brief summary of the TIGER trial, which uh, I had the privilege to present at the EHA meeting. We started this trial in 2012 when nilotinib was one standard of care for first-line CML uh, patients. And we combined nilotinib with speculated interferon in one arm and randomized between these options to achieve as a first primary endpoint an, um, an MMR at 18 months. Uh, in case of confirmed MMR after 24 months, we discontinued the interferon, uh, the nilotinib and continued interferon only. And of course, in the comparator arm, we continued nilotinib. In case of 12 months of MR4 or, late, or longer, uh, we discontinued uh, both drugs uh, for TFR. And that's the second primary endpoint, the MMR in TFR at 12 and 24 months. In summary, we have an enhanced and shortened uh, introduction, uh, induction therapy, immunostimulating maintenance, and the option for treatment discontinuation in MR4. The good news of this trial is the survival data. We have now an eight-year overall survival in CML with 95%. It's a new benchmark, and this has been achieved in a longstanding 
a 10-year observation study uh, with uh, nilotinib based. And that's very good news for our patients because only 2.5% of patients die from CML in this uh, period and 2.5% from other causes. First endpoint was the probability of MMR at 18 months. There is an advantage for the uh, interferon combination, but this is not significant. It's a significant advantage for the deep molecular responses MR4 and MR4.5. And in, when we look at the survival after eligibility for discontinuation on an intention to treat basis, that means for all patients who were able to discontinue independent, if they had discontinued or not, then we see an advantage for um, for the combination with interferon, but again, this is not significant. If we now look at the patients only who really discontinued treatment, and these are 76 <laughs> after interferon maintenance, we see an a TFR rate after two years of 86%, which is very good compared to other studies, which is based on the sequential selection of the best patients, and we discontinue treatment eventually um, for the best patients only, but even after a shorter uh, TKI period and the maintenance with interferon, we are able to achieve this 86%. Fascination was presented by uh, Thomas Ernst, and this was the first um, worldwide uh, study with Asimunib first line. As a pilot study, Asimunib combined with nilotinib, tazatinib, or imatinib in four different cohorts with the endpoint of treatment-free remission, but the first uh, endpoint was MR4, and this was presented in this uh, talk here. Um, these are the patients with the different side effects. The combination is well tolerated, as we usually see, uh, but of course not better tolerated than any of the ATP competing drugs alone. Therefore, the major advantage of Asimunib to be better tolerated has not been pre uh, presented here in this combination talk. But we achieved 38% uh, deep molecular responses by 12 months, which is uh, quite good with the combination. But as I said, the tolerability here is important. In summary, I want to conclude what is available now in the third line situation. We have the chance uh, to select the drugs on biological grounds, on comorbidities, and uh, we have also experimental studies available. There were posters on experimental designs with new compounds now being available. That, that means our work goes on even after 95% complete uh, molecular remission. Markus Firman presented what happened after TFR in the Euroski trial, and he tried uh, to calculate a predictive score uh, for discontinuation. And actually, what is important is what was already known, duration of TKI therapy, DMR duration, uh, and which is still contro controversial, the transcripts, uh, the type of the transcripts. And what is interesting, the blasts in peripheral blood at diagnosis <coughs> are still important in the case of deep molecular response in TFR. And finally, Fabio Efficace presented his analysis of the quality of life after discontinuation in Euroski, you see that the usual side effect diarrhea to some of the drugs is going down in all age cohorts, but the fatigue not. The fatigue is quite stable. Only in the younger patients, it went down. The, in the older patients, it's, it's, it's slightly increasing uh, over time. Uh, the pain is increasing. That's, of course, uh, a reflection of the withdrawal syndrome. Uh, but it's very important to look at this quality of life data um, in uh, our TFR patients as well, and to compare the quality of life for the different treatment options. Finally, I would like to advertise what we do in Harmony, in the Harmony project from the CML. I had the chance to summarize this at the meeting as well. We have four pillars in Harmony. One are the clinical trials, which are collected. The data are collected in harmony. We have 
an genomic alliance worldwide on behalf of the ICMLF a clonal hierarchy. We have an alliance on treatment-free remission uh, led by our Swedish colleagues uh, within the ICMLF. And we have a project uh, which, is, uh, which was submitted by the patient advocates on quality of life. These are all still open until October. Harmony will be continued, of course, later on a different uh, um, uh, platform, but it will be continued, but it's important to collect this data now. With that, I would like to thank all the colleagues who contributed to this data. Uh, I presented Fascination and Tiger on behalf of the German CML study group, but I would like to thank the worldwide CML community uh, for sharing their data here at EHA and for having a very collegial and uh, fruitful collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you very much for providing such a comprehensive summary of a lot of information. It's uh, very detailed. Um, so there is the opportunity to ask our presenters questions, but in while um, you gather your thoughts for questions for Andreas. We might um, uh, introduce Professor Tiong Ong, who is going to present the biological highlights of the Congress. So again, so I have a brief introduction. So Professor Tiong Ong is Associate Professor and Principal Investigator at the Cancer and Stem Cell Biology Signature Research Program at the Duke NUS Medical School in Singapore and Associate Professor at the Division of Hematologic Malignancies and Cellular Therapy at the Duke University Medical Center in Durham, US. So prior to this, he was on the faculty at the University of California at Irvine, where his work focused on understanding drug resistance in hematologic malignancies. So Dr. Ong graduated with a medical degree from Cambridge and completed his clinical and subspecialty training at Cambridge University, the National University Hospital of Singapore and the University of Chicago. So again, very warm welcome, Professor Tiong Ong, and I will hand over to you to present the biological highlights of the Congress. Um, thanks very much, Nicola, um, for your kind introduction. Well, okay, thanks very much again, and it's lovely to see you all and um, also get an impression of that you're um, dialing in from all over the world. So greetings from, from Singapore. Um, so I will just um, summarize a number of the orals and abstracts that we had uh, presented at EHA in terms of the biological highlights. And um, I really enjoyed this meeting because um, it was extremely collegial. And also it happened at a pace which was much more um, amenable to taking things in and going to all sorts of uh, talks. So I really enjoyed that aspect of it as well. So in terms of the translational or basic research that's being done now in the CML community, um, I thought I'd just highlight um, the areas that are our current focus in, in our field. And what I'm showing here is a graph that depicts three sort of typical uh, patient journeys uh, in terms of their BCR able transcript levels on the y axis and on the x axis, the number of years that are on treatment. Thankfully, uh, most of our patients, probably about 60%, achieve ELN uh, optimal responses. Those are the individuals on the green lines. And we can see their BCR able transcripts descending uh, in a um, a nice manner. At the other end of the spectrum, we have patients who are categorized as ELN failures. And these patients are at high risk of blast transformation. And they comprise probably 5 to 10% of the patients that we see in the clinic these days. And then in the intermediate group, we have patients on the orange line who are so-called warning patients. And many of these patients will have to switch um, to more potent uh, second or third line TKIs and also STAMP inhibitors during their course. And what I've described in the purple boxes are the areas of active research um, across various groups. And um, it was nice to see that many of the abstracts and oral presentations encompassed um, those top three purple rectangles. That is, um, there were a number of uh, talks on biomarkers and mechanisms related to primary responses and resistance. Secondly, there were also a number of uh, 
abstracts presenting uh, the topic in number two, that is preventing and treating blast crisis transformation. Although that's still a small number of individuals, um, it is of course deadly for these um, uh, patients. And then what was nice to see was also a number of abstracts um, investigating the management of drug-related toxicities. And you heard from Prof. Hochhaus's, um, uh, the first abstract that he presented about patient and physician perspectives, that this remains quite an important um, uh, area of interest, particularly for patients. So I was glad to see that being represented as well. And I'll talk about the abstract that dealt with that. Um, what's also very important is trying to understand what are the factors that lead to deep molecular responses and how we enhance treatment-free uh, response success as well. Um, one other introduction slide I'd like to highlight is like finding recently by a number of groups that very early on, the rate of BCRA1 transcript decline at three months seems to indicate and predict high-risk groups, major molecular responses at 18 months, and most recently from the Australian group, treatment-free responses, which occur up to five years or more from the time of diagnosis. And I think this is very striking information that I think is, is largely validated now that suggests very strongly that resistance conferring factors likely pre-exist treatment initiation. That is biology, even before you start treatment, has a strong indicator of how you're going to do. And so the first two abstracts I'm going to present um, highlight um, this notion that, and this biology that we're beginning to be faced with and understand. And I think it also offers certain opportunities that it, indeed that's the case. Because now if we know how patients are gonna do even before we start treatment, we may start making more um, guided decisions from a rational biological perspective. So the first abstract that um, looked at biomarkers and, um, and um, was from the Adelaide group where it's presented by uh, Prof. Tim Hughes. And they basically asked the question, could they measure the level of kinase inhibition vitro, in vitro um, uh, achieved while the patient was on TKI therapy? And secondly, does it have any clinical re relevance in chronic phase CML? And what they did was they took blood from 173 patients at the time of diagnosis and seven days, a very short interval following the initiation of TKI therapy. And what they did was to make cell lysates of these mononuclear cells from the blood and then run them on SDH PACE gel so they could perform Western blots. And the very simple readout that they looked at was the level of phosphocrackle inhibition. And what you can see here are two bands from patient samples at the time of diagnosis. And again, two bands again at day seven. And the intensity of this band, the phosphorylated crackle, is decreased. So crackle is a substrate that's immediately downstream of bcr able and is phosphorylated by bcr able If it's turned off largely, as you can see in this sample, then what they call this as a high IFKI or in, in, um, in vivo kinase inhibition, and it portends a good outcome because there's inhibition. You can see effective inhibition of phosphocrackle and presumably BCR able. So this is a good result. In contrast, they also had patients who had low IIVKIs or IFKIs, and these portend are probably a bad result. And what you can see here is that this phosphocrackle band uh, really diminishes uh, not at all um, in this instance. So this is likely to be a good patient, and this is terms to be a bad prognostic patient. So what did they see in terms of their patients? Well, first of all, at baseline, uh, compared to day seven, they saw the expected decrease uh, in kinase activity. And you can see that um, in terms of the percentage of kinase inhibition, there was a great variability uh, in terms of patients. And what they used was a cutoff of 11% to define um, uh, good inhibition or not so good inhibition. And here they began to relate the degree of inhibition with early molecular response quality or failure. And the long and the short of it was that both in vitro kinase inhibition 
and also the spleen size at the time of presentation seem to be two independent prognostic factors. So as spleens got larger, normal to palpable to large, um, the percentage of patients failing to achieve EMR increased. Interestingly, even if you had a, a large spleen, but you had a high IVKI or a high level of inhibition of BCR able, you still did well. So the biology seems to trump um, the clinical uh, phenomenon of splenomegaly in this case. Um, also very importantly, the combination of the two seem to predict patients who would eventually go on to blast crisis. Again, you see this relationship uh, of risk of blast crisis or bad outcome with increase in spleen size, um, which was um, uh, also compensated for if you had a high degree of intravenous um, um, in vitro kinase inhibition. Um, what they also showed was that a large spleen and a low IFK on a massive was associated with inferior major molecular remission and MR 4.5, three years from the time of that initial study. So seven day, say, days was when that assay was conducted. So biology really at the beginning of treatment seems to portend very long-term outcomes uh, up to three years out. So again, it's the individuals with large means and low if keys, which seem to do the worst. And when they also looked at a second generation TKI, um, what was interesting was that the percentage kinase inhibition was higher in patients with naloxone compared to imatinib. And also the percentage of low if keys um, was much uh, um, higher in massive compared to nilotinib. They didn't have any data uh, regarding patient outcome in that group, but I'm sure uh, they'll be looking that, at that uh, in future. So I thought this was an interesting study because it showed that an in vitro assay um, was able to predict both early and very long-term responses. And what um, their conclusion was, I think was very important, was that this sort of assay um, and assays that hopefully will come out in the future provide a unique opportunity to optimize the treatment, including the dose of TKI, possibly adding a more potent TKI or a STAMP inhibitor at the time of very soon after um, the initiation of therapy. Um, again, what all this suggests is that factors determining um, uh, IFKI pre-exist treatment initiation. The next um, uh, abstract or, or talk that I wanted just briefly highlighted was the one that um, we presented from our group in the education session. Um, this was um, just recently published on June 1st in Blood, uh, just over a month ago. And so I won't go too much into it, but it was also the subject of a commentary by David Ross. And they had a figure which in, in the commentary which nicely summarizes what our study did. And what we did was basically take bone marrow from patients in those three prognostic groups I showed you earlier, the best prognostic group that was on the green line, and the worst one, group C, in patients that transformed to blast crisis in an intermediate group. And what we did was to uh, magnetically sort the mononuclear cells from the patient bone marrow, again, prior to treatment initiation, into 34 positive and 34 negative, and then perform single cell sequencing on a 10x machine. Um, we then performed computation analysis to define a single cell map. And I'll just highlight some of the major uh, findings uh, very briefly. Um, we obtained over 150,000 cells and were able to look at almost 2,700 genes uh, expressed in each of those cells. And we used machine learning at that time to identify the cell type which had the most prognostic gene expression signature and we employed a machine learning pipeline. Basically, we asked the computer to tell us if we took a certain cell type, in this case, the leukemia stem cell from a group A, B, or C patient, what was the pattern of gene expression that could best tell which patient that stem cell was from? And we asked, we asked the algorithm, which cell type could help us best classify patients? And at the end of the day, what the algorithm told us was that hematopoietic stem cells, 
and NK cells, as well as plasma cytoid dendritic cells, were the most informative in the terms of annotating which patient that came from, and that's, that sample came from. Now, prognostic genes do not readily suggest biology, so we focused on trying to tease out biology from the gene expression profiles. And this is some little, a little bit of background that I, I, I'd like to share with you. When we look at hematopoietic stem cells, we now know that they're actually heterogeneous in terms of their transcriptional profile. And um, we do know that cells, stem cells that express these transcription factors have a bias towards erythroid progenitor differentiation and these other transcription factors to other lineages. So we began to wonder if the differences in transcriptional profile would predict differences in um, therapeutic response or TKI sensitivity. And long and the short of it was that indeed we did find master transcription factors that define different lineage trajectories in three different groups. So in the optimal response, we found a red cell trajectory and in the failure group trajectories away from red cells. What had previously been described was that erythroid much more sensitive than non-erythroid progenitors to imatinib. So what our, what our observations suggested was that very early decisions at the stem cell level defined hierarchies that were more or less sensitive to imatinib. So that was one of the major features. In terms of the other cell types that were prognostic for the NK cells, I'll just summarize that in the best prognostic group, we found hyperfunctional adaptive NK cells that have intrinsic anti-leukemic activity. And the opposite end of the spectrum, we found um, stem cell tolerant or target cell tolerant inert NK cells. In terms of um, the takeaway messages, I think what our study um, really highlighted was that it was really both pre-treatment and likely on-treatment factors that together conspire to give you the response heterogeneity that we see in patients. And rather like Tim Hughes' study, it opens the door to potentially pre-treatment prognostication and earlier management decisions in our patients. The other striking um, observation that we made was that each individual patient, whether they were in group A or group C, had a fingerprint, a unique fingerprint of good and poor prognostic factors. And what this means in terms of designing prognostic tools is that the tools that we use need to read out for the heterogeneous biology that we observe, whether it relates to stem cells or NK cells or indeed inflammation. So that was, uh, I think, the major, another major conceptual conclusion uh, from our work. So going on um, to other uh, abstracts, this was one presented by uh, um, Satu Musjoki um, from Finland uh, entitled Drug Profiling for CML Blast Crisis. So drug profiling has been done before with cell lines, but as far as I'm aware, this is the first study using primary CML cells. And what they did was to take um, primary samples from healthy controls, patients in accelerated or chronic phase, and also blast crisis, and looked at CD34 positive cells and treated them with a combination uh, of different drugs, up to 80 drugs, over five concentrations, which I think was quite important. And this allowed them to generate dose response curves. And what they showed in terms of the positive controls was yes, indeed, these cells were in sensitive to TKIs, but they were also sensitive to other drugs, uh, such as those just depicted here. And some of these drugs are new, in terms of the first report that showed that they have efficacy uh, against um, CML blast crisis samples. The other thing that they did, which I thought um, was very logical and important, was combine uh, imatinib uh, with um, different drugs, and they were using the same sort of uh, approach, and they uh, were able to identify a number of effective combinations with imatinib, including venetoclax, and the other two drugs um, depicted here. The next thing they did was to use CRISPR screens um, to determine if there were genes that when they knocked it out, um, offered potentially effective new drug combinations. Um, and so this, the, with these results, they were able to find genes 
um, this one depicted here, that if they knocked it out, um, altered the sensitivity of the cells uh, to a massive. And this is a gene that functions as an adapter for ubiquitin ligase. And the long and the short of it is that when you don't have this ligase, um, you become much more resistant uh, to imatinib. So in conclusion, um, using drug sensitivity testing, they could identify novel drug sensitivities of primary blast crisis samples, um, including these drugs here. Um, they could also determine in some of their readouts which, cell, which drug combinations were also inducing differentiation, uh, which would be very important for blast crisis. Using CRISPR screens, um, they showed new primary TKI resistance mechanisms um, and that this gene here, which is in the ubiquitination pathway, directly ubiquitin BCR able protein was an important player. And then I have um, three more abstracts that I want to um, very briefly summarize using one slide each. The I title of this abstract was really interesting and intriguing, and that's the identification of novel factors controlling non-genetic cell plasticity in chronic uh, myeloid leukemia. And it takes a page from, uh, two pages really, from what's been happening in the solid tumor field. The first is that lineage plasticity or the ability of cell types in different solid tumors to switch from one lineage to another and back under the selective drug pressure of drug treatment is one novel mechanism in the solid tumor field um, that has been described, particularly in the case of lung cancer, where non-small cell lung cancer seems to be able to switch to small cell lung cancer um, and become resistant to the standard therapy. So that's been described in solid tumors. Another feature that's been described uh, in a number of solid tumors is the phenomenon of non-genetic non -genetic epigenetic reprogramming as a hallmark of cancer that confers resistance. So what this group asked was, could they find evidence of plasticity in CML cells? And indeed they did. They found that CD24 expression fluctuated in K562 cells, and that if you take CD24 positive or negative cells, they could regenerate mixed populations. What they performed was a CRISPR screens to identify genes which promoted or impaired this plasticity. And they found <clears throat> about three, about four dozen genes, <clears throat> excuse me, which did this. I think the clever thing that they did next was to see if any of these genes <clears throat> were also differentially expressed in imatinib resistant patients. Excuse me, I'm just gonna. Take a cough sweet, yeah. And they found that seven of these genes were expressed in imatin resistant patients from the Australian Title II st um, story, uh, study. So their conclusion was that indeed they can find plasticity in CML cells, and potentially this could be associated uh, with drug resistance. <clears throat> Um, this was an abstract which I found very interesting. I'm not a classical hematologist, but basically that they, this group wanted to study thrombogenic factors in patients taking TKIs. And what was nice about the study was that they took peripheral blood from CML patients who had been two weeks on a, um, on a different numbers of, of TKIs, imatinib, nilotinib, and panitinib, and compare it to normals and also patients who'd come off their TKIs. And basically, they measured um, hemostasis readouts, platelet function, and thromboinflammatory markers. And the long and the short of it was that they found significant derangements of von, von Willebrand's uh, factor, um, platelet hyperreactivity, and no changes in inflammatory cytokines, but possibly increases in natosis, um, which is the uh, elaboration of neutrophil extracellular traps. Um, that can be prothrombotic. And what they concluded was panatinib um, was strongly associated with each, with each of these factors. And in terms of translation, because of the hyperreactivity of the platelets that they saw, um, they thought that antiplatelet treatment would not be very helpful in these patients. And they suggested that a number of these parameters, including von Willebrand's antigen, could be potential biomarkers and possibly targets for intervention 
the patients on panatin. I think one thing that they uh, could have done to improve the study was to identify, uh, to determine what the readouts were before the patient started with panatinib, and also whether or not this was correlated with actual thrombotic events. But I thought it was an interesting study because it's trying to tackle a very real concern uh, for some of our patients and their uh, uh, hematologists. I think the last study that I want to talk about very briefly was one from the Cambridge group um, led by Dr. Jyoti Nangalia. And what they did here is what a number of um, different groups at Cambridge have been doing is, and that is in inferring phylogenetic trees from whole genome sequencing of single cell derived clones from patients. In this case, they looked at seven CML patients and they did whole genome se sequencing of over 800 colonies. What they're able to then do is infer the timing of clonal expansion, when the actual BCR able clone arose in time, and the expansion rates. They also assess mutational signatures and telomere lengths uh, in these clones. And the conclusions were threefold. First of all, it was the time of clonal expansion from the first BCR able mutant to diagnosis was a span of three to 13 years. And this was in contrast to decades for other myeloproliferative disorders, and that the stem cells in their conclusion had a very high growth rate of 50 doublings every 50, of, of a clone doubling every 50 days. What was also interesting um, was that the BCR able positive clones compared to the non BCR able clones had shorter telomere lengths, and that there was a mutational signature. Um, that was present and uh, in CML clones, but not negative clones, suggesting a higher mutational burden. I think what all this does is supports the current understanding that BCR able is indeed mutagenic. Um, a negative finding was that they didn't seem to see any ROS signatures, which has been associated with mutagenesis in CML4. And it's consistent with the notion that BCR able is probably sufficient to cause CML, that no other hit was required. And secondly, um, and this was a question I had, was that the massively increased clone doubling rates, I wasn't sure whether this referred to the leukemic stem cell or more differentiated multipotent cell, because classical colony forming assays indicate that our CML leukemic stem cells, stem cells are actually less proliferative than normal cells. So it was a very interesting basic study um, that um, I think confirms a lot of what uh, the dogma in our field suggests. Um, it also was very interesting in that this three to 13 year period is exactly the sort of time when CML cases arose after the atomic bombs uh, in Japan. So roughly about uh, 10 years after the, uh, the bombs were dropped. So in over overall, I think it was a very interesting um, uh, set of abstracts and oral presentations that we saw that encompass many of the areas of current translational interest uh, in, in CML. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll come to a close and thank you very much for your attention. Dion, thank you so much. That's a, a really lovely summary of, of the biological highlights of, of the Congress. Really appreciate you taking the time to walk this through. Um, so we have, we've run over our allotted time, but you know, highlights of these Congresses are really important. So we do, we, uh, have some time if people would like to stay and ask questions. There was a hand that was raised, but it's now gone. You are no, I, have, I have a question, uh, Nicola, if I may. I have a Absolutely. question to Tiong. To, uh, um, you talked about all these compounds which may inhibit alternative pathways. What is your expectations for the future? Should we use these compounds for cohorts of patients in parallel? to the TKIs or consecutively, for instance, in TFR, when we want to address uh, and attack persisting stem cells, a maintenance therapy or a, um, a parallel therapy? I ask this question because I talked about quality of life and we know that such combinations may be rather toxic. I think that's a very important question. and at the same time, a real challenge to answer because of the quality of life. Um, and I would say that 
in the future, based on some of the studies from Sue and some of the preliminary data that we have, is that we might be able to tell from the time of diagnosis who is at a high chance of achieving TFR success and who is not. And this allows us to have a longer conversation with the patient and their family members over time as to what degree will they tolerate um, additional toxicities for hopefully a short period um, for ultimately being able to come off drug yeah. um, at the end. No, but so it's, it's a very important discussion because the survey showed that in the beginning at diagnosis, everybody wants to get rid of the risk of CML, the risk of dying from CML. That's uh, mm -hmm. very understandable. But at the later stage, quality of life is in the center of, of, of the, of the uh, aims. Yeah. And I think what really opened my eyes was um, the patient advocate session right at the beginning of the mm -hmm. um, Congress, where, where we heard some patients um, say that they just want CML out of their lives. They never want to think about it again. Um, I think maybe that was somewhat realistic, but what I, I, I got was that some patients just don't want to see any toxicities at all. And yeah. so it takes time to get to know who these patients are and what they're comfortable with. So um, I think personalized therapy and then knowing the toxicities and what gain um, they clinical gain they get out of it is really important. But even, even in TFR, the CML is not out of the life. We, we have seen this from, from um, Fabio Efficace's quality of life uh, uh, data. And we, of course, know this from our PCR surveillance uh, data. We need, we need to check. Otherwise, there is a lot of anxiety around which impacts quality of life even more. Yeah, that means mm. subcontrol is obviously needed. Needed. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you picked that study because it really highlights how um, also patients' perspective change over time. Mm. So that we have to revisit these conversations um, um, as we continue to see them. In the Absolutely. Clinic. I, I agree. I think I, I'm not seeing any questions, any further questions coming in. And I think this is a really important place to actually leave this conversation, you know, by starting and ending with the, um, the importance to, to CML patients of the work that's being done. Um, so I, at this stage, I would like to thank you both again very much for your time putting together these uh, the presentations and the highlights and taking the time to be with us today.